I don't know about you, Chris, but I put jardinera on anything I can. Oh yeah. I it's not just for me. Like I'll make Italian beef, Italian sausage. Uh, are you a combo fan? Oh, I mean, sometimes I have to be in the mood to, it's a, to it's have a lot. combo, but like, because that's a lot of food. Yeah, but I put jardinera not just on the staples, but I put it on chicken. I put it on pasta. I put it in my oatmeal. Oatmeal. You can put it pretty much in anything. It goes with everything, and you'd want to go with jardinera from our friends at J.P. Graziano. This is the real deal. This is not mass-produced commercial bullshit nope. sellout. This is real Chicago jardinera, and now. Not just can you put it on all the things I mentioned before, you can put that jardinera flavor on your popcorn. Yeah, I mean, you don't wanna have the, uh, you know, oily version of it, but you get the seasoning and you can put it on and it comes in hot and mild. I'm not a hot that, fan. I mean, I don't know why you would, no offense to the mild, you know, like it's good too. some people might like mild. I'm a hot jardinera guy. <whistles> Love hot jardinera. Always hot, put it on everything. But now, yeah, you can get that flavoring, you can put it on your popcorn, you can put it on your eggs, you can put it pretty much, I mean, this is just, this is life changing for me. Total game changer. I feel like a born again Christian when I found out that this existed. Oh yeah. Now I'm gonna be putting jardinera literally on everything, not just figuratively. Absolutely. It's gonna go on everything that I eat. Get it at JP Graziano, hot jardinera seasoning, and then get the, the, the originals too. You can't go wrong with it. Yeah, and, and a little tip, from our friends at JP Graziano. If you really want to kick up the flavor a little bit, take some melted butter, put the jardinera seasoning in it, let it reconstitute, and then cook with it. That's gonna change the whole game for you. I'm gonna do that tonight. And while I'm doing that, or after, I might watch one of the most rewatchable movies of my entire life. It came out before I was born, but <laughs> one of the most <laughs> rewatchable movies of my entire life, and that movie is. Major League. Don't you have any proven Major League talent? Now I want to put together a team that'll help us relocate to Miami. You want us to lose? We've been losing. What I want is for us to finish dead last. Major League is talked about among the best. It was never number one because it's silly of the baseball movies and sports movies, but it is genuinely funny. Like a lot of baseball movies, like Rookie of the Year. Uh, we're talking about movies that are also comedies. Rookie of the Year, Angels of the Outfield, uh, Air Bud. <laughs> like any of these movies that are like trying to inject comedy, the bench warmers into sports, into baseball in particular, are stupid. Yeah. I just named a bunch of stupid movies. Major League is genuinely funny, I think because it's rooted in reality. Like this is not an absurdist comedy. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of things that are absurd and like they exaggerate a lot of the characters, but the entire foundation of the plot, maybe not so much at the time the movie came out, but now is actually like a real thing. Like tanking mm -hmm. is a real thing, especially in baseball, like half the league tries to not compete every year, is a real thing in sports yeah. now. Not so much in the 80s, but like now it is a thing that businesses, sports teams as businesses will try to do. They'll tank the team to save money or get a high draft pick, or in this case, she's trying to move the team to Florida. Which sounds absurd, but like this is a real. Well, I like, mean, the Chicago White Sox tried to do that, right? Like they tried to leverage it, and they got this whole new stadium, which was the new Comiskey, the you know whatever, whatever yeah. the name, the name that keeps changing, right? But like they tried to do it, and they were going to move to Tampa before Tampa had a team. Yeah, and then that, that happened a couple of years before this movie came out. Yeah. So it's like really rooted in reality. Uh, the funny thing about that is that Tampa built a dome for the White Sox. And it just like sat there for years until they got a team, and now it's still this crappy dome that the Braves play in. Yeah. But th these are all things rooted in reality. So they, they get a relief pitcher, uh, or who becomes a starting pitcher, Charlie Sheen from like the penal league, California penal league. Like he was in prison. I mean, that could happen. You could have guys that had a criminal past that are mm -hmm. trying to get a second chance. Willie Mays Hayes. This is probably the most absurd thing is that he shows up to spring training uninvited. Yeah. Um, he's like the the slappy leadoff hitter who has no power, but he runs really fast. Um, they, they play into baseball stereotypes really well. Charlie yeah. Sheen can't find the strike zone, but he throws hard. William Mays Hayes, uh, Wesley Snipes can't really hit, but he runs hard. Um, Pedro Serrano, before he was in State Farm ads. <laughs> Are you in good hands? Uh, hit for ridiculous power, but couldn't Before do he was else. the President of the United States <laughs> yeah, on 24. Mr. President, I'm requesting 
requesting your permission to activate the interdiction plan. Under the circumstances, I don't have a choice but to say, put them in good hands. <laughs> so, um, and then um, Jake Taylor, <clears throat> washed up catcher from the Mexican League, trying to get a second chance. Like, they really knew baseball. Yeah. And they made like a real comedy out of it. Yeah. And, and you know, I think that we talk about the reality of this uh, movie, and I think a lot of people watch it and don't real, really understand how rooted in reality it is, you know, especially when you consider the fact that Cleveland blew a 3-1 lead. And a lot of people don't know that. They don't, yeah. A lot of people forget that it happened, but it actually did happen. Yeah, they, they lost the, it's crazy that, that people don't talk about that much. They lost a nail biter in game five in Chicago. They got blown out in game six and they lost an extra innings in game seven in 2016 on November 2nd. Yeah. It's not talked about very no, people often. People don't talk about it. And, and I think that they need to remember that movies like this are rooted in reality, yeah. even, if th even if that reality does take place 27 years yeah. in the future. The, it, well, now they're the Guardians, but when they were the Indians, they were always pathetic. <laughs> they picked the perfect team. I mean, you know, the thing about it is that the, the montage of failure that they do at the beginning with the opening credits, right, is Cleveland. And so, like, picking Cleveland, they could have picked so many different teams or, or, you know, cities. But picking Cleveland is, like, that was, like, the chef's kiss uh, because of, like, how perfect of a selection it was. And for, for, for one thing, it is essentially the Cleveland tourism video. Come on down to Cleveland town, everyone. Come and look at both of our buildings. So like, I mean, you know, the Cleveland yeah, tourism yeah, video yeah. that's so popular, the, the opening montage is that in effect. Yeah. I think it works being Cleveland because of the fact that not only, number one, do they have a lot of futility with their sports teams. Yeah, it's not just uh, baseball. Browns, uh, up until also 2016, the Cavs yeah. had won. So it's like the whole sports scene in Cleveland. And so like their fans, have become accustomed to that, yeah. right? Like, and you kind of embody that, right? We don't really have that here in Chicago. You know, yes, we have underachieving teams, right? The Bears haven't won since 1985. Um, I mean, and just what is going on with the Bears, right? I think it's going to change, right? Justin Fields is our savior now. I think I might have said that about Mitch Trubisky. I think I might have said that about Jay Cutler. But Justin, Justin Fields is our guy. Fields. Sets his feet, heaves one deep with nobody home, it's picked off. The Cubs up until 2016, right? Up until they did the rebuild leading up into 2016, right? Like so much futility that until they won, until they broke through in, in um, 2003, getting past the opening round, right? They had the wild card in, in 1998. Yeah. But until they broke through in 2003, like, it was all futility, but then they had 2007 and 2008, which, as shocking as it is, was the first year that the Cubs had been in the you know playoffs back to back years since 1907, since like 1907, 1908, right? Like yeah. is just bonkers, right? But yet, even still, Chicago fans don't have that pessimism. Yeah. It's always about we're gonna, you know what? This isn't our year. We're gonna suck this year, but next year gonna be really great we've got so and so who's coming up this guy's gonna come up this guy's gonna do this so and so is gonna get better he's just gonna, you know i mean and chicago fans are also can be fractured like i'm a cubs fan a bears fan a bulls fan uh like barely follow the blackhawks but anyone could be like i'm a Sox fan and a bulls fan i'm a Sox fan and a bears fan i'm a cubs fan and a blackhawks fan like there are so many different ways yeah especially for having two baseball teams you can go in so many different directions especially if you grew up on the southwest side versus the northwest side like it's a regional thing going on. Like it's very fractured and each team kind of has an identity and there's some overlap. Yeah. Especially like pre-2000, I think like 2003 and then 2007, 2008 really changed the Cubs identity and people like wanted to win. But for a while it's just like I'm going to drink beer yep. and look at the Ivy. There's so many different identities where it's like you can choose your own adventure kind of as a Chicago sports fan. Cleveland, it's like you're a Cleveland sports fan. They got yeah. one basketball team, they got one football team, they got one baseball team and they are the three identities are very similar. And it's like you're a Cleveland fan. Wisconsin has this too. And I find them so fucking insufferable. Cause you had a bad day. You take it one down. You sing a sad song just to turn it around. If you're a Bucks fan, you're also a Brewers fan, you're also a Packers fan, you're a Badgers fan. 
and like that's like one identity. Um, there are some other cities like this, like maybe Detroit kind of has it, but like Cleveland is very like we're a Cleveland yeah. sports fan. Yeah, and we're and, it's, and it also mirrors a lot of what Cleveland went through during the recession too, and kind of over the last fifty years. Is this kind of like a meh, yeah? Meh. I mean, you, you, right? Like, but you also have to think about Cleveland fans associate themselves. I think more, and uh, this is uh, you know until recently, right? When there's the, been the success of the Indians slash Guardians or whatever, and the Browns, right? And the Cavs. Until that success, I feel like Cleveland fans associated themselves less with professional sports and more with Ohio State. Yeah, because they're winning. Because they, yeah, because they win on a regular basis. That's enough about Cleveland and their fans. That was and too their much about Cleveland. That was way too much. And I feel dirty. I feel like I just took a dip in Lake Erie, or, uh, which you know, is a disgusting lake, and or their river, which caught on fire. A lot of people don't remember that. Look it up. Caught on fire. A river. Water. Fire. It's very eerie. It's very creary. Oh, God. Bad. Bad joke. Bad joke. Bad I mean, joke. say what you will about Lake Erie, but at least it's not stuck up like Lake Superior. Uh, with that, I think we should get into the movie. Yeah. Um, I feel like it wouldn't be an 80s movie if you didn't have some sort of song from Randy Newman. Fat man with his kids and dog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Randy Newman's right there with all of the music for this, uh, for this movie. Uh, right out of the gate. Yeah, and this is like barely, this is 80, 89? 89. Yeah, so it's like just at the end. And it's perfect that it, the time it came out too, they captured the old Cleveland Indians uniforms, which yep. I think are great. Yeah. Uh, I think they went to the... They changed a couple years after. I want to say like 93, 94 maybe. They captured that, and then they captured an 80s vibe. At like, I mean, you can make a movie in 91 and sell an 80s vibe, but like, sure. it feels much more 80s than it actually was. Um, and then the cast is also perfect kind of for the, like, the late 80s, early 90s. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, perfect for the... Especially like Charlie Sheen in this role like is kind of an epitome of Charlie Sheen before yep. he went full off the deep end. I was banging seven gram rocks. That's how I roll. Winning. I had one gear go. Epic winning. Uh, tiger blood and all of that. Come on, bro. I got tiger blood. Winning. Um, but perfect in this role. Um, I, I feel like there are a lot of, when you watch this movie and you go, oh man, it's that guy. Yeah. Oh, it's that guy. And you, like you remember them from all of these other different movies, right? Or, or shows or something like that. So they did a fantastic job of the casting of it and the storyline of it and getting of what, how Cleveland is just a shithole. Yeah. Um, and also they, they have a, a plot running at the same time as this like really realistic baseball but funny scenario. Um, and the other things they have that are realistic is like Charlie Sheen hooking up with a teammate's wife. Yeah. It sounds ridiculous. This has happened before. Um, Prince Fielder's wife cucked him with uh, Evacel Garcia when they played for the Tigers. There was a rumor that Dave Martinez had sex with Ryan Sandberg's wife. I mean, this stuff apparently just happens, which I find bananas, but like, it was rooted in reality. They have another plot going on at the same time as Jake Taylor trying to get back with his ex-wife. Yeah. And that runs at the same time and they conclude at the end. It, it just like, they, they knew what they were doing. They knew! Uh, is what I am getting back to. It's like the last third of the movie is almost entirely this one game playoff at the end with the Yankees. Yeah. And it is so, it captures the anxiety of that situation. Yeah. Of that elimination game. It feels like a real baseball game. It looks like a real baseball game. And, and, and having been at a one game playoff before and having been at elimination playoff games in the audience, like they capture the anxiety of that so well. Whereas other sports movies, like I, I might have mentioned before, I'm, I hate the movie Field of Dreams. Not only because the plot is ridiculous and it's stupid, but they didn't even know baseball. Like they have, rest in peace, Ray Liotta, playing shoeless Joe Jackson, hitting right-handed. Yeah. Like you didn't even like take the time to, to like re do any basic research in this movie. The people who made this movie like really know baseball. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Um, I just have so many notes. So many notes about this I do movie. Too. Like I love it. It's the epitome of his character, Willie Mays Hayes. His shitty ass car that he drives up in that's supposed to look like a Rolls Royce, but it's really a VW Bug. Yeah. Like underneath it, like 
It's perfect. Like, it's little things like that that make this movie perfect, rewatchable, enjoyable, no matter what. But I do want to ask about, do you feel like this movie, like, forget about the whole Indians, Guardians part of it. Do you feel like this movie has got a little bit of uh, cultural appropriation and uh, inappropriateness that happens in there? With, like, Native Americans? Well, with Dennis Haysbert culturally appropriating this uh, 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 Car- Car- uh, is, is he Caribbean or is it from well, Cuba this or is what the like, thing. do it's, we know? It's so ambiguous, I don't think so. You don't think so? Serrano wants some extra power for tonight. He's looking to sacrifice a live chicken. If, they, if, if this movie came out now, yeah, maybe people are like, what the fuck? Well, I just wonder if it's still, ma- like, do people still do voodoo? Because like, if they still did voodoo, like, don't you think they would be really pissed off about this and like, he'd have a voodoo doll? I mean, if you're still doing voodoo and you're outraged about this movie, I think people would make fun of the people that were <laughs> saying that they're insulted by the voodoo in the movie. I think the fact that it's ambiguous, I mean, his name's Pedro Serrano, you can kind of like yeah. make an assumption yeah. about where he's from, I guess. But they make his origin story ambiguous enough that I don't think it's offensive. Maybe. What about the, what about he like to sacrifice the... a live chicken? Like, yeah. To sacrifice a live I don't know. I, who know? I, I, I don't know. I only ask the questions, right? Like, yeah. I don't really have an answer, but like, what about the, um, you know, sexually inappropriate uh, behavior from the owner towards the players and then in reverse the sexualization of their boss? Uh, I f- so like where, so for example, right? Like Rachel goes and like, touches Willie Mays Hayes' hair, which is like in a very like, kind of like questionable way. I think, think people might be upset about that or like I think cause slapping Pedro Serrano's ass as he's wearing just the jock strap and his ass is hanging out. I think because of the gender roles, I think it's okay. You think it's okay because it's the other, but then, but then they sexualize her because wasn't she like an exotic dancer? And then yeah, they, they take, take the, her and they, every, yeah. with every win, they take off a piece of her clothes. Every time we win, we peel a section. I think that's okay too. Call me old fashioned or maybe because I've seen this movie a thousand times and I can't get it out of my head. I think it's okay. I mean, uh, look, it, it, it's a part of the movie, but it's not like the part of the movie. And I don't think it like makes it, I don't think it takes away anything where somebody's going to be like, I can't believe that they're doing that. I can't watch this movie. This is yeah, offensive to yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I don't think that that's the case. Um, but. I think it's okay. I don't even think there's much in this movie that gets dated because I think you could even other now, than other than Willie Mays Hayes, the American Express don't don't steal home without it, oh, and yeah. then poor dude uh, gets hit with tax evasion. Well, another, a couple decades later, another Wesley Snipes. No, this is my favorite nugget from the movie. He's apparently so slow, like he's not athletic at all. If you notice in the movie, every time Willie Mays Hayes is running or stealing a base, it's in slow motion. It's because it, to make him look fast, like he wasn't actually fast. So every time in the movie he steals a base, and then in the first scene that he's doing baseball activities where he he's uh, he wakes up late and he runs out of bed and then runs when they're doing sprints and he beats everybody, it's in slow motion. It's because he's fucking slow. <laughs> and he needed to find a way to make him look fast, which I find hilarious. There's another, I think... I want to say Chris Rock was bad at basketball, so in Grown Ups, they never show him doing any basketball things. That's, I mean, yeah, that stands to reason. That's yeah. that's pretty uh, pretty funny. Can we talk about uh, f- actual baseball for a second? Mm-hmm. And can we talk about how Charlie Sheen is Mitch Williams? Yeah, no, that's. I think that's like right. That's, that's not uh, like that's not. That, I mean, I know that that's not, but like, can we talk about that for a second? Like, no, I, I think it's. I, I think that's like on the nose. And can we then talk about how the Mitch Williams trade was the shittiest trade, one of the shittiest trades bad. that the, the Chicago Cubs did? Yeah. Um, not necessarily because, like, he was a bad player when he was with the Cubs, but, like, because of the fact that they traded away Rafael Palmeiro and yeah. Jamie Moyer. Well, it's because Rafael Palmeiro was also rumored to have slept with Ryan Sandberg's wife. Everybody going after Ryan Sandberg's wife. <laughs> that's, that's a real thing. <laughs> Give it a goog. Um, yeah, no, Mitch Williams then took the song Wild Thing and made it his welcome music, I think, yeah. after this movie. 
And I do remember that. I remember that whole thing. And they, they rebranded him kind of as Wild Thing. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, in, in relation to that. Do you think that it's possible? This is just a, a crazy, this is one of my, uh, you know, crazy crackpot theories that I'm gonna throw out there at this point. It's time for Chris's crackpot theory of the day. Um, do you think that the 2016 Indians lost because former Chicagoan Jason Kipnis um, and uh, what's his first name? Uh, Napoli. Mike Napoli. Mike Napoli uh, got Joe Boo statues in the playoffs that year. Did they? I they know did. That. Uh, do you think? And do you think that's why they lost? They probably didn't feed uh, feed Joe Boo a live chicken. They probably did not feed Joe Boo a live chicken and give the uh, alcohol, or they may have actually taken the shots of, for, rum. of, of rum for Joe Boo. Up your butt, Joe Boo. I. I think Charlie Sheen also lobbied to throw out a first pitch during the World Series. And they didn't let him? And I don't think he did. Yeah. Because that was about the time, that was not too long after Tiger's blood and all of that stuff, yeah. right? I think he's just now being accepted back into society. And I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure he wanted to throw out a first pitch and he did not. Yeah. Someone to fact check that for me. Um, but that's bad, that's bad karma right there. Yeah, very, very bad karma. A uh, little tie to Chicago is that the library scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, where Jake goes to go get his ex-wife uh, at the library. That was actually filmed at Northwestern, uh, in the Deering oh. Library of Northwestern. The, the baseball scenes are filmed at County Stadium in Milwaukee, too. Yeah. Speaking of Milwaukee, I really had no exposure. Look, growing up, I was big into baseball, as most red-blooded American kids were uh, in the you know, late 80s, early 90s. Big into baseball. But I had no exposure to the American League because I was a Cubs fan. And because of that, I had no exposure to the Brewers. Two-run blast, and the Brewers win! And so I only knew Bob Uecker from this movie no, and, and Mr. Funny. Belvedere. And that's Mr. Funny. Belvedere. But from this movie and Mr. Belvedere. So I had no knowledge that he was the announcer for the Brewers. And it didn't... There was, there was no knowledge of that until 1997 with play. the first interleague play series where it was the Cubs and the Brewers, which I actually went to that game uh, in, at Wrigley Field, that like all of this kind of came together. It's like, oh, Bob Uecker is actually the announcer for the Brewers, and there's, there's a relationship. Now, now, fuck the Brewers, but that's... Right. It's funny because I, I might have had the same thing because I saw this movie when I was really young and saw it over, I loved it, and I saw it over and over again. And I, I associated him, and I think I still kind of do, because I've never listened to him call a full real game before. So I think I do like, associate him more with this movie than his actual baseball work with the Brewers. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and I associate him with Mr. Belvedere, too. Yeah. Don't forget about Mr. Belvedere. Right. That's really important. A couple things about Charlie Sheen, right? He actually pitched in high school. Yeah, he's actually athletic. So he's actually athletic, unlike Wesley Snipes. And Charlie Sheen actually took steroids for this movie so that he could pitch faster. And like he actually wanted to method act and actually pitch um, in these scenes. And did you know that the end of this movie, um, where everybody's celebrating and having a good time and everything like that, um, actually took place uh, in 2016 after game four? Did you know that? You didn't know that? And, and um, unfortunately, everybody was so busy celebrating uh, after game four that they forgot about game five, six, and seven. It's weird how they were able to do that in the future and then bring it back. Hey, you know, they got into DeLorean or something like that and uh, made it happen. It's a shame that they, they, they celebrated so much after Game 4 because they should have kept Charlie Sheen available out of the bullpen for Game 5 so they wouldn't lose 3-2. to two, Well, you'd think. You know, or because, yeah. like, Trevor Bauer was awful in that game. Um, and then Game 6, if Charlie Sheen could have started that game, then maybe they don't get blown out. On short out. rest. I mean, he would have yeah. had to have started yeah, on you've short got rest. Win at all costs. But even at a, at a bare minimum, you have to have him starting with game seven. And they you know. threw Corey Kluber for the third time in the series. That wasn't going to go well. I mean, it was not, not very smart. No. Um, yeah, I mean, I just, you know, it's amazing how great of a movie this is, like for a sports movie, because there's comedy element to it. And as you pointed out, right, like comedy movies and, and sports movies don't really go hand in hand. Yeah, this is the only, I love, there's a lot of sports movies, a lot of baseball movies I really love. Uh, the Natural, Moneyball, um, 
Bull Durham, which I guess Bull Durham's a comedy yeah. too, but it's not as like slapstick. Yeah. This is the one that's the funniest and also still is a good movie. It has two sequels, Major League Two and Major League Three Back to the Miners. <laughs> and like most trilogies of movies like The Hangover, um, the couple, I mean, I like all the Rocky movies, but I have said before, Rocky Two is a parody of Rocky One. Rocky Three is a parody of Rocky Two. Rocky Four is a parody of everything. Rocky Four is the only movie that really should matter because it's the <laughs> one that ended communism. <laughs> yeah, but by the time of Rocky Four, it's like you, you, these movies are silly. There's a robot in it, whatever. Um, Happy, May- birthday, Polly. <laughs> Happy birthday, Polly. <laughs> Major League Two is kind of like a retread of Major League One. It is ridiculous. Jake Taylor is the manager mm-hmm. in this one. The end of Major well, it's not it's not ridiculous because I mean, didn't that happen D- with the Ross. Chicago Cubs? Yeah, but but no, but he like becomes a manager in the middle. It's very. Have you seen the movie? I I unfortunately have seen the movie with Omar Epps taking Wesley Snipes' place uh, as. Uh, yeah, yeah, because Wesley Snipes is in the movie, and then uh, Roger Dorn's like the owner or the GM. Like it's yeah. all preposterous. Yeah. And then the end of the movie, Jake Taylor goes to take Charlie Sheen out of the game because he's the, he has a bad matchup with the dude in the White Sox, and Charlie's like, uh, or or he he's supposed to get out another batter, and Charlie's like, no, I want to walk him to face the guy that I'm bad against. And Jake Taylor's like, okay, <laughs> walk the batter to set up a bad matchup. It's just like it's a terrible movie. I want Parkman. All right. It's not baseball logic. It, um, but it's like it's forgivable, sort of. That's like a bad sequel, and then they make Major League Three back to the minors, which is like the Rocky Five of this. Now, wait, now, am I wrong? I did not actually see the third one, but am I wrong in remembering the like Rube catcher from Major League Two is in Major League Three? Yes, and they play, it's a minor league team playing the Minnesota Twins. I haven't seen this in like at least a decade. So I don't remember how they set that up because that makes no sense. Yeah. Um, but it's like a triple-A team plays uh, the Minnesota Twins for some reason. I mean, I don't know. I, I, look, I like this movie. I think it's still enjoyable even with all of its flaws and whatever. Um, and it helps me to remember that Cleveland blew a 3-1 lead. And I don't know if anybody has told you that Cleveland blew a 3-1. I know not you, but yeah. like... No, to, people, to the audience. People I don't know that. if anybody has told you that Cleveland blew a 3-1 lead, but and not a lot of people know, but Cleveland blew a 3-1 lead. That they did. Uh, in November, in the year of our Lord, 2016, the Cleveland Indians blew a 3-1 lead. Um, I often refer to that, that, that seven-game span as Major League Four. Uh, the score for this? You want to go first? Uh, sure. You know, I think that uh, I think it's enjoyed enough. I don't think it's... Uh, going to break seven Ooh. Um, just because people have certain feelings about it. Um, I'll go sex number again, six, nine. Re- okay. Um, just, just because it's like right on the cusp of breaking seven, but it's not going to break seven. And of course it's going to break seven, but I'm going to still say 6.9. Hmm. Interesting. I'm going to go seven. I'm prices right. You seven, zero. Seventeen. I, I, I said I was going to be wrong and it was going to break seven, but... You said sex in the brain. <laughs> Chicago won and uh, Cleveland Blue were 3-1 lead. <laughs> <laughs>